This is 8 Rue Bonaparte, where Edward Manet was born in a first floor apartment, just about a block from the Ecole de Beaux-Arts on the Rue Bonaparte itself. His father was a judge and the family was wealthy on both sides. Since he was a poor student, though, his father enrolled him in the naval school, and when he was 17, he sailed to Rio de Janeiro, but decided during that adventure that he wanted to be a painter. His father then pointed him toward the Ecole, but that was too conservative for him, as was the studio of Thomas Couture, thought of by many as radical, but which Manet thought was like a tomb, although he did study with Couture on and off for several years. Nor did he like the atmosphere Chez Père Suisse, about which we've heard. This is the absence drinker now by Manet. In the 1850s, he traveled to Holland and Italy. Some of his work certainly is said to show the influence of Dutch painters, especially Franz Hals. But anyway, when this was submitted to the Salon in 1859, it was rejected, despite Delacroix's vote in favor of it even though it's about as unlike anything Delacroix ever painted as could be. Here are Manet's wealthy parents painted just about the same time, although they don't look more than middle class at best. He wasn't to travel to Spain until 1865, but he could see some Spanish pictures in the Louvre, and the usual claim is that if the art of any other country really had a dominant influence on him, it was that of Spain, especially in the emphasis on stark dark, dark black and white effects like we see here. This looks like it could have been painted in Madrid, maybe by Velasquez. This is Velasquez Aesop in the Prado, and it looks here more like the absinthe drinker than probably anything in Holland. Even before he went to Spain, his fascination with it was enough to earn him the nickname Don Manet y Corbetos, the latter referring to the realism a la Corbet, which is also evident in these early pictures, although Corbet himself did frequently criticize Manet's pictures, despite their shared interest in realism in the largest sense. In 1861, the picture he painted of his parents, and this picture, often called just the guitarist, again, mucho hispanico, of course, were his first to be accepted by the Salon, although this one was roundly hissed by the public. However, Manet had become acquainted by this time with several important writers, including Courbet's friend, the critic Champfleury, another influential critic, Edmond Durante, and the poet and critic Charles Baudelaire, all of whom did like it. The Café Tortoni, which was owned by the same fellow who owned the Grand Befour, which still exists in the Palais Royal used to be here on the Boulevard des Italiens, and Manet usually spent some time in it every day and at various other long gone such places which have always been a big part of life in Paris. This is a print of the scene there, circa 1870. Balzac, Stendhal, Guy de Maupassant, and Marcel Proust all used it as a setting for various episodes in their work. The whole building was nicknamed La Maison Dorée, the Golden Mansion. It's all now the headquarters of Paribas, the French bank, which seems suitable. This is another view of the building. The Tortoni was on the left side of it. The Café RD, also famous, was on the right side of the building, and about a block away to the right was the equally famous Café Riche. The Café de Bad was on the opposite side of the intersection at the left where the Librairie del Duca is today, and this is where Manet often had dinner. He was certainly somewhat like Baudelaire's ideal flaneur, as he describes him in Le Peintre de la Vie Moderne, although he actually uses the English word dandy. Dandy carries the wrong sense to us today, though. A dandy is just a fashion-conscious aesthete. The flaneur is more of an observer of life as opposed to a participant. The term dandy is insulting, flaneur more just descriptive. In this picture, Music in the Tuileries, which Manet painted in 1862, we see Le Tout Paris, including a lot of flaneurs and a few dandies as well probably, attending a concert in the Tuileries although there are no musicians visible and no one seems to be paying any attention to it if music is being played. 
A dozen or so prominent Parisians are said by various authorities to be in the picture, including Manet himself and his brother Eugène, Baudelaire, Théophile Gautier, Zachary Estruc, Fantin Latour, Offenbach, Champfleury, and in the foreground, apparently, Madame Lejeune, an old friend of Manet's family. This picture was not entered in the Salon competition, but displayed at the Martinet Gallery with several other pictures uh, Manet had already painted, and it was again treated harshly by the public. The faces were described as blobs, which in many cases they are, which fact, combined with the de rigueur coat and top hat, makes everyone pretty much look like everyone else and makes some of the d identifications uh, less than convincing. This is a close-up of the picture. It was thought disturbing because it wasn't properly framed. Some people are just partly visible at the edges. The subjects are not idealized or glorious at all. The brushwork is sloppy, and the colors, again dominated by black and white, were not pleasing. In this close-up, Manet himself is thought to be at the extreme left, and Champfleury is in front of him. Manet's father is likely represented here posthumously as the fellow with the red cap. He had just died and left Manet a fortune, so even if he hadn't sold the painting yet, he didn't need to pinch centimes. To the right of him is Madame Brunet, who would be the subject of Manet's first commissioned portrait painting, and to her right, next to the tree, is Henri Fantin Latour, and in front of the tree is Charles Baudelaire. To his right is Théophile Gautier. The fellow at the far right is possibly the painter Basile, about whom more later he's wearing a kind of gray pith helmet. The woman on the right in front is probably Jacques Offenbach's mother, and on her left is Madame Jaws, a friend of Manet's family. Manet's brother Eugene is in this close-up talking to what looks like just, as the critic said, some blobs of paint. Jacques Offenbach is at the far right in this detail. The next year, 1863, he submitted Déjeuner sur l'herbe, which we'll see in a moment, to the Salon, it was refused, along with a lot of other pictures by artists soon to be known as Impressionists, Monet, Cezanne, Pizarro, Whistler, Basile, Fantin Latour, and Sisley all had their work rejected. Renoir had a peasant girl with a goat done in a romantic style accepted, which, however, he tore up in disgust at the Salon's policies. This is a cartoon by Daumier depicting an angry painter who's taking it out on his refusé picture. In response to the controversy which arose over the great number of refused pictures, Napoleon III himself authorized the holding of a separate exhibition, which came to be known as the Salon des Refusés. This is Manet's famous déjeuner sur l'herbe now. Manet did have some reservations about putting this picture with the other refusé because some other important artists were said to be having second thoughts about being lumped with those who really deserved to be refusé, and only about 500 of the 2,000 or so refused pictures were finally exhibited. You may remember that Courbet's return from the conference was itself refused admission even to the Salon de Refusé, apparently on the orders of Napoleon III himself. The man on the right with the funny hat in the picture is said to be Manet's brother Eugène, or some say his other brother Gustav, and the other fellow is possibly Ferdinand Lehnhoff, Manet's future brother-in-law. Some even go so far as to argue that Manet's future wife, Suzanne Lehnhoff, posed for the body, which has his favorite model and likely mistress, Victorine Mouron's head. This seems really unlikely to me. Among critics who might have been expected to be supportive, like Castagnari, there were complaints about Manet's style. The unfinished, imprecise look of the work, the flatness of the composition, which makes it look like an indoor picnic done in a studio, which it was, and the fact that the men were clothed while the woman was nude. 
Many, in fact, thought that some joke was intended by the whole thing. The composition of the picture is very obviously based on an engraving by Marc Antonio Raimondi of a drawing by Raphael called The Judgment of Paris, which had itself been influenced by Michelangelo's famous image of Adam on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. Raphael just reversed the image of Adam. And Titian or Giorgione's Fetch Champetre also would seem to have been an influence. Uh, both this picture and the Raimondi engraving are in the Louvre, so it would have been easy for Manet to see them, and he had also seen the Sistine Chapel on his trip to Italy. Here's the Dejeuner full size again now. It does seem that if he's not making a joke, he is perhaps at least trying to say that this kind of updating can't be done, like rewriting Shakespeare in modern English, say. The result is just kind of bizarre and inexplicable. The nudity itself didn't shock many, though some seem to have been upset by the juxtaposition of the nude with the clothed men. However, Manet's friend Zola pointed out in his brochure about Manet that there were at least 50 nudes in the Louvre with clothed men in the picture. This is Cabanel's Birth of Venus, the biggest popular success of the official salon that year. And it was actually criticized for immorality as much as Manet's picture, although Napoleon III did buy it. Manet gave the déjeuner to the husband of the woman in the foreground of music in the Tuileries, uh, Commander Jean, an old friend, as I said, of the Manet family, and he hung it in his drawing room. Emile Zola said this Venus of Cabanel looked like she was made of pink and white marzipan. Manet himself never explained what the story or message or symbolism or whatever of the picture is, but it made him famous, and where there's fame, fortune usually follows. But he had a fortune. What he wanted was to be regarded as a great artiste. In the fall of that year, 1863, he did also marry Suzanne Lanehoff, the sister of the fellow next to what is said by some to be her body, if not her head in this picture. She was already the mother of the boy who was apparently Manet's illegitimate son, but who had been passed off as Mademoiselle Lanehoff's brother for many years. Some even think the boy might have been Manet's own brother, the illegitimate son of his father and Suzanne. In August of 1863, Delacroix had died, and Manet and Baudelaire had attended his funeral, and a few months later, in January 1864, Fantin, Fantin Latour included them in his homage à Delacroix, homage to Delacroix and the Orsay. Fantin Latour is the fellow in white, Baudelaire is at the lower right, and Manet is standing to the right of the portrait of Delacroix, who seems to be looking toward him. The critic Champfleury is sitting to the left of Manet, and another critic we'll hear more about, Edmund Durante, is sitting at the far left. The fellow standing on the left side next to the portrait is James McNeil Whistler, the American-born expatriate bohemian who had met Fantin Latour in 1858 and through whom he met most of the future Impressionists as well. Whistler's picture, The White Girl, was almost as much talked about as Manet's Déjeuner sur l'herbe. The subject is Whistler's mistress, Joanna Hiffernan. Whistler became friendly with Courbet, but after she posed in the nude for the latter, the relationship fell apart. He is, of course, also the painter of Whistler's mother, one of the few pictures, like Mona Lisa and American Gothic, which for reasons it isn't easy to explain, have achieved a kind of icon-like symbolic status. After moving to London, he had a famous quarrel with John Ruskin, whom he sued for saying his nocturne in black and gold was a pot of paint flung in the public's face. In 1865, Manet's work created an even bigger sensation when Olympia, as she's called, was accepted by the salon that had refused déjeuner sur l'herbe. The model is generally thought to have been Victorine Mourant, who often posed for Manet, 
who is also likely the woman in Déjeuner sur l'herbe, as we've heard, although it has been argued that Manet had Marguerite Belanger, one of the mistresses of Napoleon III, in mind. Again, as with Déjeuner, there is a Renaissance precedent in Titian's famous Venus of Urbino, and Goya's Ma de Nuda may also have been on his mind, considering his interest in things Spanish and black and white as a dominant color scheme. He was not to go to Spain, however, till the fall of this year, and so he had never seen it unless in reproduction. Anyway, he wrote a letter to Baudelaire complaining about the insults the picture received when it was displayed, as though this were a surprise to him. It is, in fact, difficult to understand both the reaction of the public and Manet's own reaction to this reaction. Although his own comments seem inconsistent with this, it's almost as though, as in Déjeuner sur l'herbe, there's at least an element of parody. It's almost as though he's saying this is a subject which now looks wrong, even funny, and laughter does seem to have been the main response, at least from the public. Most authorities certainly seem to think she does represent a prostitute. Exactly how she got the name Olympia isn't certain, but it was apparently a kind of nom de guerre for courtesans of various types. The cat is also said to be suggestive because Shaw was another euphemism for prostitute, Shaw, the French word for cat. Again, with regard to the shock the public felt, there were other remarkably similar works, at least a dozen or so one could cite from the previous half century, which are essentially on the same theme, but maybe with the important difference that they are all, as it were, set in an imaginary world of typically oriental fantasy, somewhat like Angre's example we saw earlier. Nudity had long been acceptable among the gods, of course, and then, as I'm suggesting, in foreign fantasy settings, especially Oriental, i.e. Arabian or Turkish ones, and Olympia is neither an idealized Venus nor lolling in a sultan's harem. She's like a naked woman suddenly in your own living room. It should be remembered that Titian's Venus was never meant for the kind of public display that was Olympia's lot. She's not embarrassed, however, rather somewhat embarrassing, and a not unnatural response and embarrassment is to respond with laughter and ridicule, which is just the way things went at the Salon. Still, why did Manet not expect this reaction? Maybe he himself just didn't realize what he had done. Maybe he meant this to be an odalisque like Angers and was upset because people just thought it was a failure. Well, anyway, all this has made Olympia one of the most commented upon paintings of the 19th century. Looking ahead, Victorine Morin appears... For the last time in a Manet is The Woman in the Railway of 1873 or 4. By this time, she had also begun painting and eventually had several pictures exhibited at the salons. This picture was also considered a baffling departure from what had come to be considered traditional subject matter, though it was accepted by the Salon 1874 and bought by one of Manet's biggest fans, the opera singer J.B. Farr. This is a photo of Victorine, which Manet owned. This is a photo of Prosper Merimé, who was one of the whole galaxy of 19th century French authors of the rank somewhat below Hugo Balzac, Flaubert, and Zola. His short story, Matteo Falcone, which Walter Pater called the cruelest story he'd ever read, and the novel Columba are both set on Corsica, which he had visited, in 1841, he traveled to western France with George Sand, and they stayed here at the Chateau de Boussac, where they found the famous Lady with the Unicorn Tapestries now in the Musée de Cluny. Merimé had the title of Inspector General of Historic Monuments and was looking for such things. This is Sand's bedroom. Merimé was one of her many temporary liaisons, the most famous of which, of course, was with Chopin. In Spain, Merimé had met the future empress, Eugénie de Montijo, painted here by Winterhalter, and became something like her tutor in the mysterious ways of the French. And according to tradition, her mother told him the story that became his most famous accomplishment, Carmen, which Georges Bizet, of course, then turned into what has become 
one of the most popular operas ever written. As I mentioned, Manet was fascinated by things Spanish, and both before and after his trip in the fall following the Olympia Salon, he painted many pictures with Spanish subjects or showing Spanish influence. While we see some of them and some other things that are relevant, we'll hear from Carmen the Toreador song. Carmen, like so many pieces of great music, was not especially popular in its first run, and Bizet died at 37, never knowing what a success he would be. It was premiered here in the Opera Comique, or Sal Favar, as it's known, on Place Boileau, near the Sal Garnier, the opera house. The building of Bizet's day was destroyed in a fire that killed almost a hundred people in 1887, and it was rebuilt as you see it here. This is a view toward the stage. Messieurs les officiers, je vous remercie. <laughs> This is the dead matador. Close up. A more successful matador. Another Maho. The bull ring. Another bull ring. A smoking gypsy, like Carmen. <laughs> A photograph of Celestine Galli Marie, the very first Carmen. Manet's portrait of his favorite Carmen, Emily Am. And this is a photograph of Georges Bizet. After Manet returned from Spain in 1866, he met Emile Zola, who had championed his work to the extent that it cost him his newspaper job, and Manet painted this portrait of him in gratitude. On the wall is a copy of Olympia in front of Velasquez Bacchus with a Japanese print to the left. On the table is a pamphlet which Zola wrote in praise of Manet. Zola was a boyhood friend of Cezanne when they were growing up in Provence, and he introduced him to Manet, though Manet was not at first much impressed by his paintings. Also in 1866, the Café Gerbois on what's now the Boulevard de Clichy became the favored meeting place for an increasingly important group of artists, including Monet, whom Manet had also just met, Degas, Pizarro, and others, Zola was just starting his answer to Balzac's Comédie Humaine, the rougon macquart cycle, which, say the critics, moved beyond realism to what's sometimes called naturalism, a, a grittier realism. In some of the books, there's just really no one to like. They're all bad, weak, stupid, they're greedy and untrustworthy. 
and some aren't even politicians. The Café Nouvelle à Ten stood on Place Pigalle till 1960 or so in various later incarnations before being completely redone. After the Franco-Prussian War, the artists and writers around Manet and Zola moved to this larger venue. In his book Louvre, called The Masterpiece in English, Zola wrote about the world of the arts in his day, and Cezanne apparently felt that the events in the life of the main character were too similar to his own for coincidence and were, moreover, presented in an unflattering way. In any case, their correspondence and their friendship essentially ended after Cezanne read the book. This is where the Nouvelle Athene used to be, and you can establish your own nightclub now if you want. The place is for rent. Louvre was not especially successful, but some of the other novels in the series, like Germinal and L'Assommoir and La Cure or The Kill, are considered themselves to be masterpieces in the history of French literature and also made Zola rich. The Closerie de Lilas on the Boulevard Montmartre, and now over 150 years old, was also patronized by many of the artists and writers of the 19th century, including many students at the Atelier Suisse. Zola, the Goncourt brothers, Paul Verlaine all spent a lot of time here. This is the interior. It's really more well known now, however, for its 20th century clientele that included Hemingway and Scott Fitzgerald, but it's much more upscale now than it was in their day. Zola built this chateau in Medan in the suburbs west of Paris and frequently had his fellow authors Guy de Maupassant and J.K. Wiesman as guests here. In L'Assommoir, there's a memorable account of a trip by some members of what H.L. Mencken called the bourgeoisie to the Louvre to pass the time before a wedding dinner. They're mostly impressed by how shiny the floors are. It's easy to make fun of the bourgeois museum gore, of course, but I think some architects may have gotten a chuckle out of Zola's house, too. There's a lot of glass in this place uh, to be throwing stones from it. Zola was a Republican, though, and by any reasonable standard, a man concerned about social justice his whole life. And when a man sticks his neck out the way Zola did in the Dreyfus affair, I guess one can forgive bad taste in architecture. This is a painting of the garden sides that used to look made by Cezanne when they were still getting along. Zola's house is on the right. Dreyfus was a Jewish army officer falsely accused of treason and exiled to Devil's Island. Zola took up his case and eventually was instrumental in gaining his release, largely as a result of his publication of the evidence he had accumulated concerning anti-Semitism and corruption in the army. Zola was himself put on trial for libel then and moved to London to avoid jail and was only allowed to return ten years later after being pardoned. We'll hear more about this later. By the time the poor Charles Baudelaire died in 1867, he had been a friend of Manet's for many years. He apparently appears, remember, in music in the Tuileries and more certainly in Fantin Latour's homage to Delacroix, of whom he was also a great admirer. Manet never painted his portrait, however, apart from a possible cameo like that in this sketch. His magnum opus is Les Fleurs de Mal, considered by the majority of critics to be the most important collection of French poetry in the 19th century, although he is not usually put quite at the same level as a literary figure as that occupied by Hugo Balzac and Zola. This is Courbet's portrait of him, which Baudelaire didn't like. Le Fleur caused him to be prosecuted for immorality, but he got off with a fine and did no prison time. The success to Scandal, which this brought the poetry, of course, caused the first edition to sell out immediately. It was dedicated to Théophile Gautier, but also to the reader, as in the famous preface, The Hypocrite Lecture, Mon Frère, Mon Semblable. He thinks we're hypocrites because although we want to do a lot of daring, even evil things, we don't have the guts to do them. And then we have the nerve to criticize authors who allow us to have these adventures through their expression in a literary or other art form. 
This looks forward to Nietzsche's famous claim that a lot of people we call good are so simply because, as he put it, they have no claws. They don't have the capacity to do evil. It was Baudelaire's focus on sex and death, however, that really upset people. Although he didn't paint Baudelaire himself, Manet did paint his mistress, Jean Duval, in a giant dress here. Beauty, says Baudelaire, is independent of considerations of morality. It can come from heaven or hell. It can be euphoric and poisonous at the same time. And this is certainly true in the arts, the products of which simply can't be judged the way we approach things in real life. But that's certainly one of the things we like about them. Art, including literature and music, allows us to have experiences that would be dangerous in real life. That's an idea that goes back to Aristotle's discussion of the importance of Greek theater. This is the front page of the first edition of Le Fleur de Mal with Baudelaire's corrections on it. It is true, however, that sometimes art itself can be dangerous. Cervantes says reading so affected Don Quixote that fantasy and reality became indistinguishable to him. And Wiesmann's hero, Des Saint, about whom more later, withdraws from mankind altogether into a kind of intellectual, literary, artistic, and sensual private world of his own. Wiesmann was a great admirer of the German thinker Schopenhauer, and to put it very quickly, Schopenhauer argued in his book, The World is Will and Idea, that the world of the idea was better than the world of will. In other words, the inner world of experience was better than the outer, outer world of it, and experiences produced by art are part of the inner world that should really be our world. This is a self-portrait by Fantin Latour. He's best known now as a painter of flower still lifes. In 1868, he was copying in the Louvre and introduced Manet to Bert Morisot when they met in a chance encounter there. Manet was to paint her many times and she eventually married his brother. This is the first picture of her he painted. She's at the lower left. And this is a clear imitation of Goya's Mahas on a balcony. It was exhibited at the Salon a few months later in 1869. Antoine Guillaume is the man in back, an artist friend of both Manet and Zola, who had introduced them at the Café Gerbois. And Fanny Klaus, a violinist, is the other woman. Mademoiselle Morisseau had been exhibiting successfully at the Salon since she was 23 and is 29 here. She and Mary Cassatt would become the two prominent women in the Impressionist group. This is a photograph of Manet by Nadar. Manet was already married when he met her, but it's interesting to speculate what might have happened if he had been still a bachelor. He spent a whole lot of time with her and painted her more than any other model, including Victorine Moron, something like 15 times. In any case, she married his brother, as I said, in 1874. Bizet's opera, The Pearl Fishers, is about two friends in love with the same woman, and I'm going to play the most famous part of it now. In this duet, the two friends vow to renounce their love, but only one of them lives up to this. That seems like reason enough to play it here. Baudelaire says he can barely conceive of a type of beauty in which there's no melancholy. That seems relevant also. As I was saying, art's different than life. We don't want to be made to feel sad in real life. But we often go to the opera or the theater specifically to feel emotions we wouldn't want to feel in real life. This is Manet's portrait of Jean-Baptiste Farr, considered the greatest baritone of the day. He was also an art collector and a friend of Manet's, owning at 1.67 pictures by him, as well as many by Degas and Pizarro and the other Impressionists. He didn't like this portrait of himself, however, and try as he might, Manet never could finish it in a way that pleased Farr. So you can imagine he's singing the baritone part here now, but it's actually Bryn Terfel with Andrea Bocelli as the tenor. The Pearl Fishers was premiered in 1863 in this building in Paris, now called the Théâtre de la Ville on Place du Châtelet. C'était le soir Dans l'air Par la brise tiédie, Les this is a self-portrait by Bert Morisot. Appelez la 
Bird by my name. Again by Mene. In 1972, he painted this bunch of violets and sent it to her, and in the most famous portrait of her, which he painted, she's wearing a bunch of violets on the front of her blouse. And this is that picture. Here she is by Renoir with her daughter Julie. Bert died at 54, the year after this was painted. It was also at this time that he met Stéphane Mallarmé, who would become co-guardian with Renoir, actually, of his niece Julie, whom we just saw. And he painted this portrait of Mallarmé. He was a very influential French poet himself, whose salons later drew people like Yeats and Rilke. Edgar Allan Poe was one of the most popular authors in France in the 19th century, and Baudelaire and Mallarmé both translated The Raven. And Manet made the drawings for Mallarmé's printer. There was something about the dark, dreamlike, and certainly mysterious atmosphere in Poe's work generally that appealed to the moody French writers who were essentially contemporary with him. Poe is also a poet whose work is memorable in part because of the sound of it, as in the bells. And Mallarmé was interested in this also to the point that he's considered very difficult to translate now. This is Manet's picture called Boating an Argentoy. As I mentioned earlier, Manet probably first met Monet at the Café de Bade in 1866, and by the early 1870s they were well acquainted. They were both represented by the dealer, Duran Ruel. Manet helped arrange for Monet to rent a house at Argentoy, where he had family connections. It's remarkable how helpful most of these artists often were to one another when they were rivals for the connoisseur's dollar. And Manet painted this picture of Monet on his studio boat. Monet himself had met Renoir, Basile, and Sisley in Paris at the studio of Charles Glaire, who was, like Père Suisse, uh, a teacher reasonably in sympathy with what they were trying to do. Glare was another eccentric, like so many people in the arts in the 19th century. He spent some six years traveling in the Middle East and finally came home after nearly dying in Cairo. This is a picture he painted in Egypt. He had no ambition except to paint pictures that satisfied him and only exhibited a few times at the Salon, although he had considerable success with uh, popular academic subjects like mythology and history. He never married and 
spent essentially his whole life on meticulously finishing his pictures. Fortune, talent, health, he had everything, but he was married, was his lamentation over a friend's fate. This is Monet's picture called the Bridge at Argentoy. Many call Monet the Raphael of water. There's no one of our generation who can paint a landscape like he can. Monet was also a friend of the photographer Nadar, and in 1874 the latter agreed to rent his place to Monet and his friends for what has come to be known as the First Impressionist Exhibition. This is what that bridge Monet painted looks like now. Like a lot of places the Impressionists painted in the suburbs, Argentoy is pretty heavily industrialized today. Manet did not participate in the Impressionist exhibits because he thought it would damage his chances with the Salon, which he still thought of as the only venue for the best work, despite all the problems he'd had with the juries. This is a photo of Nadar's building where the first Impressionist exhibit was held in 1874. Manet's refusal to participate irritated many of his painter friends, including Bert Morisot. Monet and Pizarro really took the lead in the exhibition and wanted to go so far as to set up a cooperative society for mutual support, sort of like Van Gogh would later have in mind, but nothing substantial came of this. Some were worried about the government's reaction to what sounded socialist. This is that location today. In the end, the exhibition opened here in April 1874 with pictures by Monet, Degas, Renoir, Cezanne, Pizarro, Morisot, and about 20 others. There was a total of 135 paintings in the exhibition ran for a month, causing much the response that the Salon de Refuse had. Few of the names were yet well known, the subjects were poorly painted as it seemed, and often had undistinguished or immoral subjects. Again, the members of the potentially art-buying public mostly felt like they were being made fools of. The exhibition only attracted a total of around 3,500 visitors paying a franc apiece, while the Salon sold 400,000 tickets at 10 francs apiece. So you can see why some, like Manet, held out for the more prestigious venue. One of the few pictures not trashed by the critics, although no one bought it, was Bert Morisot's portrait of her sister Edma and her baby in a cradle. This is probably the most well-known of her pictures and is now in the Musée d'Orsay. Manet's friends Durandi and Zola said nothing about the exhibition at all, perhaps out of loyalty to him. Castagnari was one of the few critics who were both prominent and positive. This is now the most famous of the pictures Monet put on display because when he was asked for a title, he called it an impression. It's now known as Impression Sunrise. The influential critic Louis Leroy then seized on this and began referring to the whole group in the show as impressionists, by which he meant painters of unfinished pictures. We'll hear a lot more about Monet next time. This is a portrait by Degas of Manet and his wife, Suzanne Lanoff. Manet's private life was very complicated, and exactly what his relationship was to various women isn't completely clear. He had married Suzanne in 1863, and soon after that, Degas painted this picture of them, Suzanne playing the piano and Manet looking bored. Then, by the next time he came to the house, Manet had wrecked the picture by stabbing her portrait with a knife. Degas took it and walked out in disgust. Manet himself repainted the picture of his wife alone. She was a good pianist, and Emmanuel Chabrier, who was a good friend of the family, bought at least 12 or 14 of Manet's paintings and dedicated his impromptu to her. This is Manet's portrait of Eva Gonzalez, whom he met in 1869 and who became his only real pupil, and she's another interesting woman in his life. As is Nina de Calais, who was one of the most prominent women friends of Manet and ran a salon which is always described as having been very entertaining. 
She is one of the women Proust is said to have used as inspiration for Odette in A La Recherche du Temps Perdu. Another inspiration for Odette is said to have been Mary Laurent, who certainly led quite a life. She performed in a theater skit in which she emerged naked from a shell like Botticelli's Venus, and this caught the eye of a wealthy American expatriate dentist named Evans, who was quite a story himself, having rescued the Empress Eugenie during the Franco-Prussian War. There are several pictures by Manet said to be portraits of her, but this is the most likely, and she is at least the most likely of these women to have been something more than a friend to Manet, and later also she became the mistress of Mallarmé and apparently several others as well. This is Manet's portrait of Antonine Proust, uh, not related to Marcel, a lifelong friend of his, uh, of Manet's, who became Minister of Fine Art and was able to arrange to have him awarded, not without some trouble, the Légion d'Honneur in 1881, by which time Manet himself was very ill and couldn't walk well. His last major picture, finished when he had less than a year to live, is a bar at the Folly Berger, a place of entertainment which still exists in the same place, although not in the original building. A café concert like Les Folies was a place where one could eat, drink, and watch a show usually dominated by provocatively clothed girls and comedy. Here's Manet's picture now. The barmaid was a girl named Suzon who came to Manet's studio to pose for the picture which has drawn almost as much commentary as Le Déjeuner sur l'Herbe and Olympia. The setting is the large café itself, with the interior scene reflected in the mirror behind the bar, although there are some anomalies about this, whether intentional or not. It's hard to tell just where the mirror is to start with, and of course, if the figure at the right is Suzanne seen from the back, she's not in the correct place. It's almost as though Manet has in fact intentionally mixed up the mirror reflection with the real world in an inextricable way. In any case, Suzanne doesn't look very happy, and this gives a kind of melancholy quality certainly to the whole atmosphere of the picture, as though a point is being made as well about the confusion of life and the transience of superficial material pleasure. Manet died at this address, uh, of causes related, it is usually said, to syphilis in 1883 at the age of 51. This is his grave at Passy. By the time he died in 1883, there had been seven Impressionist exhibits, and although his influence on the Impressionists, most of whom were friends and acquaintances, is hard to judge, he can be seen as painting from a point of view, if not exactly in a style that influenced them. He makes no attempt to disguise that fact that what you're looking at is a man-made thing. You're not given the feeling you're looking at something immaterial and as it were perfect with no brush strokes visible and the illusion of the third dimension to marvel at. From this perspective it is easy to see why many art historians and many artists themselves see him as the 19th century painter whose work seems to most foreshadow the painting styles of the next 100 years. Okay, next time Monet will lead off. <laughs>